Father in heaven, we know that you have gone before us. We know that you have and are inviting us to you. You have invited us here this morning to be a part of worship, to be a part of of, of hearing the word, uh, to be a part of the fellowship of one another, to be a part of, of encouragement and loving and caring for each other. It it was not our design. It was not our plan. It was yours. God, I pray this morning that as you, you meet with us or as we meet with you, you would find us with glad and cheerful hearts, that you would find us with, with uh, uh, encouraged spirits and, and attitudes like Jesus. I pray this morning that as we gather, that we would be encouraged and lifted up, that we would be energized and, and filled to overflowing so that, that after after we experience worship this morning, that we are able to go and be on mission for you. We're able to, to help grow the kingdom like you've called us to do, that we, we will go and be the hands and feet of Jesus. We will be the body of Christ wherever it is that we go on Sunday afternoon through Saturday evening, that we would continue to be on mission even all the more with the things that we are facing today. But in all of that, God, may we trust you, may we lean in on you, may we find our strength from you because you are our rock, you are our refuge. And we love you and praise you in the matchless name of your son, Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. I don't know who's more excited, Shane or I, to actually have people here. God's uh, never created junk. Everyone's got a voice because he's made it that way. And it's that voice I hope that you can exercise this morning. Yeah. 
in the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe and felt the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus your living hope that we have, that faithfulness of God that gives us the strength to endure, lets us find joy in trials. It's the living hope that we get to share every day with every breath of our life. And it should make us want to sing. It should make us want to celebrate until we have nothing left. Hey, 
exhausted every single way with our bodies weak with our voices strength you are still the song in that never ends we can't help but stand and start it all up. so when we've exhausted every single way with our bodies weak with our voices strained you are still the song in us that never ends we can't help but stand and start it all again so i raise my hands until my strength has faded standing on until my knees give way and i will lift my voice and shout a grateful song i will sing i will sing until my voice is gone i will sing i will sing until my voice is gone It's in his presence that we find the power. Not by our power, not by our might, but it's by his spirit. This song has been one that's been ringing true for me for the last couple months. That in everything we face, God's made a way. His promise is ever true. In darkest times, moments where we can't see the end, where our plans are thrown away. He is ever faithful, ever true. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place I worship you I worship you because you are we make miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my God that is who you are Even when I don't see it, you're working. 
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh, you are. Waymaker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Sing it out to that. your name. Well, good morning. Uh, if you are here with us in person or if possibly you are watching online, it is so good to be able to be with you. This weekend marks a significant weekend in the life of the church. And if your wheels are spinning and you're like, whoa, what's, what's going on this weekend? What's, what's important with the church calendar? If that's you this morning, that's okay because that, that was me several years ago, like all these different church events and things that maybe the church celebrates outside of Easter and Christmas. Maybe we don't keep up with some of these as much. That's fine. But this morning, this morning is Pentecost Sunday. And some of you are like, oh, Pentecost Sunday. Wow, awesome, man. We should like be celebrating. Let's, let's throw a party. And then, you know, a few others are like, Pen a what? Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after Easter, 10 days after the ascension of, of Jesus into heaven. Pentecost Sunday, many say, was the birth of the church. So very important, right? Like why we do what we do. Well, it was birthed at Pentecost a few thousand years Ago, but maybe the most significant thing that happened on that day, the most significant thing, even more than maybe the birth of the church, was that Pentecost marked the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
Acts chapter 2, if, if you'd like to kind of read along, uh, Acts chapter 2, we're going to read the first few verses and just kind of hear what happened as we continue in this series on the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, beginning in verse 1, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, sort of like this, right? We were, we were gathered together, or we're gathered together in one place. The believers were gathered together. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. How crazy would that be? Right, you're gathering together with, with some friends. You're, you're, you're kind of settling in, you know, kind of waiting, anticipating what God might do. And next thing you know, there's like flames. There's tongues of fire settling on those around you. Some are like, man, that'd be kind of cool. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers can you hear that? You get that? So, so these believers, the Holy Spirit had, had come upon them. And as they were speaking, as they were communicating, the things that were coming out of their mouths were not their own language. And, and they weren't just some language that nobody understood or that nobody heard. No, they, they, were, they were the languages of different dialects and different nationalities and different people of that area. Uh, I, I'll do my best here. I probably ought to skip some of them because I, I know I won't pronounce them all right. But verse 7, they were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are, are from Galilee. The believers are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native language. Here we are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the areas of, I don't know, and I don't know, and from Rome, Cretans, Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has Done. What an amazing work of the Holy Spirit. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked one another. But yet there were those around who kind of scoffed and said, nah, they've just had too much to drink. I don't think, I don't think just by having too much to drink, all of a sudden, then you're able to speak in a different language. Today, as we continue in this series on the Holy Spirit, the verse that we focus on this morning, one pastor said that this verse is probably the most important verse in the entire New Testament. You say, man, that's a pretty bold claim. I think all of them are pretty good. I think I know a few that are pretty solid. But if there was one verse, if there was one verse in the New Testament that you could follow, one verse that, that maybe you could put at the top and say, if I'm gonna do one thing, if I'm gonna follow one thing in the New Testament, it's going to be this, these, these few words that we're going to read in just a second. Because they are that important. They are so very important. They are found in Ephesians chapter 5. If, if you want to turn quickly to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to read a few verses in 
in that book. But this verse is so very important. Ephesians 5, verse 18. It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, and this is what's so important, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. If there was one verse in the entire New Testament and you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow that verse. I'm gonna do everything that I can do. I'm gonna trust I'm gonna trust God to work in my life, to fulfill this verse in my life. This might be the verse. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I I wanna read the the verse, the few verses before and after that, just to give a little context. We don't have time this morning to talk about each one of these, but I think as I read through them, I think you might... There'll be a connection, I hope, with the verses that we find around this idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity because the days in which we live are evil. I don't think that you need to look far to be convinced that the days in which we live today are evil. You can see it on the news, you see it on social media, you you see it wherever you look. We live in a world of wickedness and evil. And, And God's word is so very true and it is so very timely. We are called to make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly don't be careless with with your actions with your words with your posts on social media don't be thoughtless and don't be careless but understand what the Lord wants you to do that's so important we can't talk much about this but it's I, I think it's so amazing that this is right here before this idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit that says understand what the Lord wants you to do understand what the Lord's will is for you how do we know what what God has for me how do we know what the the next step should be in my life how do I know whether whether I turn this way or whether I turn this way I don't think it's a coincidence that the next sentence the next verse talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, well, let me back up. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But for the next few moments, let's focus on those few words that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I confess, I am not an English major, okay? But here's what I've learned over the past few weeks. This section of scripture, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is called an imperative. For those of you that love English and are good with English, you know what an imperative is. I didn't, I had to look it up. So let me, let me help you if you're, you're wondering that. An imperative is, is a command. It's almost as if you're being bossed around. Somebody is telling you what to do. Now, let me pause for a moment. Kids, do, do mom and dad ever boss you around I got some head nod how about an amen for many of you guys amen amen yes it's sort of like that it's sort of like mom and dad saying clean your room I'm sure they say it much nicer than that though hey uh pick up your stuff 
That's, that's what an imperative is. It's a command. And so we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and not to get super Englishy, that's probably not even a word, is it? Not to get super Englishy on you, but the verb in these few words about being filled with the Holy Spirit, it is a present imperative. Which means you could, you could say instead of being filled with the Holy Spirit, we are to keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. This filling of the Holy Spirit is not a one and done. Hold that thought. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But we are to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. A quick few questions that I would like to talk about and address with this short passage. The first question is this, how do I know? How do I know that the Spirit lives in me? How do I know that I have the Spirit? I've got some verses I want to share with you. 1 Corinthians 3.16. I don't believe they'll be on the screen. If you want to jot them down, look at them later. Check my work. That's okay. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If you know Jesus, if you have a relationship with Jesus at the point when you say yes to him and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you. You have the Spirit living in you if you know Jesus as your Savior. Ephesians 1.13 And now you Gentiles also have heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. So what God does when you say yes to Jesus... He makes a deposit on your behalf. And it's His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that He gives to you to come and live inside of you. John 14, 16, and 17. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another advocate who will never leave you he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Not just with you. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? That the invisible spirit in you is better than the visible Jesus with you. So very important that we get it, that we realize, and that we understand the significance of the spirit's living in us do, do, do we fully grasp do we fully grasp how important it is that we know and we get it that the spirit is living in us this spirit is God the spirit God the father who created the universe who created the world who, who set the stars in place who has, has named every one of them, who holds all things in the palm of his hand, who sustains your life, who, who heals, who redeems. This same God who, who gave his best gift, who gave his son, Jesus Christ, to come and die for us, 
the, the third person of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit lives in you if you know Jesus. The Bible tells us that who knows the thoughts of a man except for the man's spirits? And who knows the thoughts of God except for God's spirit, even the deep things of God. And this is the same Holy Spirit that lives and dwells inside of you and me. And it is so very important. We, we must, must get this, grasp it, understand it, and live like we know it. If you know Jesus, the Spirit lives in you. The second question I want to wrestle with here for a moment is this. What's the key to being filled with the Holy Spirit? If, if, we, are, if we are commanded, if it's an imperative that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what's the key to that? How, not how, we'll get there in a minute, how we do it, but what is the key to being filled with the Spirit? Here's what I think many of us think. We, we would think and we would say this, oh, I, I want more of the Spirit in me. Like, I, 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 want, I want more of God's Spirit. Give me more of the Spirit. I get that. I understand that. But let me challenge that for a moment and say that the, the, cha- the, the peace isn't that, that we just need more of the Spirit because we have the Spirit. We were given the Spirit when we trusted in Jesus. The issue is this. It's not that we need more of the Spirit. It's that the Spirit needs more of us. It's not that we need more of the Spirit. But the Spirit needs more of us. The key to being filled with the Holy Spirit is yielding to God. The key is is this, and we don't like this very much because it's not politically correct, but the key to being filled with the Holy Spirit is surrendering. It's, it's submitting. It's being submissive to the authority and the power of God. It is yielding our lives to his. It is, it is putting our, our faith, trust, and trusting in that God will care for our lives. That we trust him with everything. And that we live our lives in such a way that that bears that out, that people know when they see us outside of church context, they see us on Sunday afternoon, they see us on Monday or Wednesday or Friday night or Saturday, or they see us on social media, and they recognize that you have yielded your life to the power of God, and you've given yourself to him fully. How do I know that? I'm going to let you study it, but if you read through the book of Acts, Acts 2-4, right at the day of Pentecost, what were the believers doing? They were all gathered together, right? They were waiting on God. They were waiting on a movement of God. They were yielding their lives to him. And what happened? The Holy Spirit blew the place up. The Holy Spirit showed up and filled the believers because they were waiting and yielding on God. You think if they were going and doing their own thing, you think if they were were going out and not listening to God and not following him, do you think the Holy Spirit would have come like that? They were yielded to him. Acts 4, 8, we find Peter filled with the Holy Spirit as he's yielded his life to God and he's speaking on behalf of the good news. He's sharing the gospel and he's given his life to God and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 4, 31, Acts 6, 5, and 7, we find Stephen. Stephen who is selected because it's recognized that he's 
There's something different about him. He's got the Holy Spirit in him. He's, he's filled with the Spirit. And then later, as he's in the middle of losing his life, we find that he still is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's giving his life to the fullest extent to God. Acts 9, 17, Acts 13, 9, we find pattern the pattern of people yielding their lives to God. And as a result, the Holy Spirit is filling them. Billy Graham wrote in his book titled, The Holy Spirit, it's not how much of the Spirit we have, but how much the Spirit has of us. I hope you can make that shift this morning. It's not about how much of the Spirit we have because we have, we have the Spirit living and dwelling in us, but how much of us does the Spirit have? The third question is this. So how, how can we be filled with the Holy Spirit? How, how can we be assured that the, the Spirit will, will fill us? There are some things that we can do to encourage the filling and the overflowing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The first one is this. It's not very popular, but it's confession. It's confessing our sins. When, when we have done something we know that we shouldn't have done, we should confess. When we haven't done something that we know we should have done, we should confess. When we have said something that we shouldn't have said, we should confess. When we, when we fail to say something that we know that we should have said, we should confess. When we haven't lived in such a way that is pleasing and honoring to God, we should confess. But we need to take that a step further. Because if it's only about confession, then we'll find ourselves in a routine and a pattern of just confession, confession, and confession. But what we also need is we need repentance. We, we need to turn from those sinful ways. That's what repenting means. It means to do a 180. So if, if we're pursuing this and it's ungodly and it's sinful and we shouldn't be, then repenting means we are going to turn 180 degrees and we're going we're gonna to run in the opposite direction. And really, we're going to run towards God. We're going to run towards his righteousness, towards his godliness. So the first thing that we can do is be people of confession, people of repentance. The second thing is this, stop living in the power of the flesh. Stop living in your own strength. Stop living in what you think your own power is. This is, this is one of the things that plagues me. I, I, I get frustrated with myself. Like I know that there are things that have to be done in a given day. There's, there's work to be done. There's stuff to be completed. There are tasks that need checked off. And I just like to go get them done. Forgetting that God wants me to include him. That he wants to be a part of everything. Of every aspect of my life. And that he desires that I put him first. And so instead of me rushing off and just thinking I'm too busy to get everything accomplished and do what I need to do. Instead, I need to pause, quiet myself, and pray, and give those things to God, trusting that he will be able to accomplish so much more through me than I ever could without him. sort of along the same lines, we need to pursue God's will for our lives. 
There are things that we want to see happen so very badly. There are things that we want to, to have happen in our lives, things that we want to have happen in other people's lives. Maybe they're close to us. Sometimes we can wrestle and struggle with, we want to be the Holy Spirit for someone else. And we just need to pursue God's will above our will. Pursue his will beyond our will. And you say, well, how do you know what God's will is? Let's go back to Ephesians 5.18, the next sentence. Don't get drunk with wine. It'll lead to destruction, but be filled with the Spirit. And the last thing is this, is to walk in daily dependence of the Spirit. That when we wake up in the morning, that when we, we, we head off to to, to, to work or we're working at home or whatever, whatever it is that we do in the day, that we just give it to the Spirit and we allow the Spirit to work in the way that he chooses and wants to work. And it may mess your day up, but it'll be worth it because it's God's plan and not yours. And his plans are greater than our plans. We can't be the Holy Spirit, though. We can't do the work of the Holy Spirit. And I, I hate saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. We can control only what we can control. We can't control the Spirit. We can't control how the Spirit works. So here's what each of us can do. This isn't limited here. Every one of us, no matter how young, no matter how old, every one of us can do these two things. And I believe these things are so very important. If we want the Holy Spirit to fill us, there are two things that we need to do. There's, there's two attitudes that we need to to have. Let me illustrate. You can't fill a vessel that's not open. It's impossible. Can't do it. If we desire to be filled with the Spirit, we've got to take the lid off. We have to be open to allowing the Spirit to fill us. He isn't going to take the lid off for you. He wants so bad. If, if you've got this lid on, he wants so bad. For you to take the lid off so he can fill you. Or we could be like this vessel. I'm about out of water. Now, this vessel took water, right? Was able to put water in it. But if you notice, if you could see this vessel is already filled up with significant size rocks, significant size pieces in this vessel. And for many of you, this may represent your life as opposed to not being open. Your vessel's open, but it's already filled with these big rocks that don't move. And so when the Holy Spirit 
chooses to, to fill and pour into your life, those rocks don't move and the spirit is pushed to the edges, pushed out to the margins, to the only areas that you allow the spirit to be. And so the spirit can't fill us the way that he wants to fill us if we don't empty ourselves of the things that we need to empty ourselves of. And here's the deal, just like the Holy Spirit won't pop that lid off, he's not gonna force you to remove those big rocks, those things out of your life that need moved out so that he then can take that space and fill that, that area. He wants to fill you. So the question that you and I must wrestle with this morning is this. We have, if you know Jesus, we have all of the Holy Spirit. But does the Holy Spirit have all of you? There's a a famous pastor, some of you know his name, his name's Chuck Swindoll. I came across this prayer this past week and it's, it's so fitting. But Chuck Swindoll says that many a morning, he begins with a prayer that sounds like this. This is your day, Lord. I wanna be at your disposal. I have no idea what these next 24 hours will contain. But before I sip my first cup of coffee, and even before I get dressed, I want you to know that from this moment on, throughout this day, I'm yours. Help me to lean on you, to draw strength from you, and to have you fill my mind and my thoughts. Take control of my senses so that I am literally filled with your presence and empowered with your energy. I want you, or I want to be your instrument, your vessel today. I can't make it happen. And so I'm saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need you so, so badly. And we need you in so many ways. Not to say that you haven't provided for us, that you haven't strengthened and encouraged and healed and redeemed and all the so many things that you've done for us. But we, we need you this hour. Oh, oh, we need you. God, would you help us to understand fully, completely that if we know your son, Jesus, that we have your spirit living in us, dwelling inside of us, leading us, guiding us, directing us, And I believe that for so many, we desire to be filled with your spirit, filled to overflowing so that those around us would get a taste of what it's like to know Jesus and to get a taste of what it's like to be filled with the spirit. Father, may we live contagious lives. But in order to do that, we need your spirit more and more each and every day. And so for us this morning, I believe that means that we give more of ourselves to you each and every 
day. May we yield our lives. May we surrender them to you. May we submit to your power and trust that in your time and only in how you work that you would move in us and fill us to the fullness with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Amen. So normally at this time, um, we, would, we would call ushers forward, right? We would, we would play a video maybe of... Um, a ministry of the church. We'd have someone share a testimony of, you know, how maybe how God's worked in their lives. Um, but obviously, we just, we can't do that this morning. It's going to be a little bit different. Some of you uh, already figured it out. Uh, but when you, when you walk through those double doors back there, there's a, there's a black box about yay high. It's got the, the New Hope uh, logo on it. Man, we, um, we knew that we wouldn't be able to pass offering plates up and down aisles, obviously because they're spread out six feet, but obviously because we don't want people having to share that plate and touch and all of that. Even if it's okay with you, for some people it may not be, and we just, we don't want to do that. And so these boxes back here in the back, they're offering boxes. And so as you came in, I, there were a few of you that I, I saw you, you threw an envelope or you, you threw some, uh, uh, you're giving in there. That's what those are for. We'd love for you to use those um, since we won't be, uh, won't be passing an offering plate around. But as well, if, if maybe, you know, you're like, oh man, it's been so long since I've been back to church. I didn't even think about that. I didn't even bring the checkbook. I didn't, I didn't bring any cat. That, that's okay. That, that's, it's okay. Because we also still do online giving and you can, still, uh, you can still be generous that way. And it's very, very easy. It's simply at the New Hope website, newhopealive.org. You click on the menu button in the top left. You click on the give button. You fill out a little bit of information. You click submit. And it's so easy to do it that way either. Whether you drop a, an envelope or something in a box or you do it online, we, we, we just want to say thank you. Man, we have been so overwhelmed over the last few months with how you have continued to be generous. You have continued to give. Sometimes what happens is it's very easy. Oh, I'm not at church. I don't show up. I don't go to a church. It's easy to either forget or to, or to not continue to give. But you've done that. So thank you so much for helping us and allowing us to continue the ministries of New Hope. It's only because of, of your generosity. It's only because of how God is the example of that, how he gives uh, so, so very well and only perfect gifts. And so thanks for your generosity. Heavenly Father, uh, this morning, uh, we just want to pray and ask your blessing upon, upon what is given, upon the offering that is made on your behalf. God, we ask that you would receive what is given and that you would take it and you would bless it and that you would multiply it. Multiply it so that we can grow your kingdom, so that we can reach across the streets and all across the world. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing upon uh, us as we give, knowing that, that as we give, you are so ready, you are such a good father, and that you pour out your blessing, blessing upon blessing, we can never outgive you. So I pray your blessing upon your people. In Jesus' name, amen.